Her father was a merchant, a ship owner, a banker, and he made and lost several fortunes here. Caroline Healy was baptized, brought up, and married at the West Church up here on Cambridge Street. She frequently visited Elizabeth Peabody's bookshop on West Street and attended Margaret Fuller's conversations both at the bookshop and at the nearby home of George and Sophia Ripley. In this general area at Faneuil Hall and elsewhere, she attended anti-slavery meetings, um, other kinds of reform meetings, helped conduct women's rights meetings, and delivered her own four series of lectures on the woman question, becoming, she believed, the first Boston woman to speak on a public platform in Boston. So I come to you today to introduce to you a remarkable text, the journals of Caroline Healy Dahl. I did not discover this text in a moldy trunk in an attic, nor indeed on an internet auction website. Rather, for about a century, it has been cared for and protected in a major repository. It's even been microfilmed and copies offered for sale. Scholars have used it and dissertations have cited it. But up until now, almost no one has recognized the immense treasure that Caroline Healy Dahl's 45 volumes of journal constitute. In the two decades during which this text has been my life's obsession, I have marveled over and over at its power. It's a remarkable work of contemporary history, certainly. But just as remarkable is its ability to captivate the reader by its eloquence and the compelling story that it relates. It is literature as well as history, an engrossing narrative as well as a fund of facts. The author of these journals was no ordinary person, unselfconsciously keeping a diary in obscurity, little expecting that anyone would read it. Instead, she was a woman privileged, educated, and in her own day famous, one who we have every reason to believe recognized her own diary's significance. Who will care for these many papers, she wrote at age 20. Who will ever read or, at my request, take pains to preserve that I have written? In her 70s, Dahl solved the problem, arranging for her papers to go eventually to the Massachusetts Historical Society, where they've been faithfully cared for. As Caroline Dahl must have foreseen, they have proved useful to the scores of historians and literary scholars who have mined them for information on major movements and great figures in the 19th century. But I suspect that it's taken much longer than Dahl imagined for her journals to be resurrected and valued in their own right, rather than as the source of information on someone or something else. As she reread her, own, her old journals when she was in her 70s, she herself was astonished at their power. My life, half forgotten, now reads to me like a romance, she wrote, and kept on reading compulsively. I myself, who came to Dahl's journals in an attempt to ferret out information on the transcendentalists and their contexts, soon found myself captivated entirely by the journal's compelling narrative, by their near flawless style, and by the distinctive personality of the author that they so vividly project. With a mind both informed and acute, and a worldview imbued with a strong gender consciousness, Dahl filled her journals with intelligent reflections upon and keen analysis of her world. Caroline Healy Dahl's journal, which covers three quarters of a century and is in its entirety, I believe, the fullest account of a, an American woman's life in the 19th century, will, I believe, take its place alongside the other great texts of the American Renaissance, Emerson's Essays, Thoreau's Walden, Fuller's Woman in the 19th Century. It will serve as a counterweight to the skeptical and condescending depiction of women's rights woman, women, women's rights women in Boston in Henry James's The Bostonians. Likewise, it will stand as a complement to the education of Henry Adams as the story of a woman shaped by 19th century Boston culture, told in the first rather than the third person, immediate rather than retrospective, 
and embodying rather than rejecting the city's moral enthusiasms. Dahl's journal is, however, most of all, a good story. And yet, it's more than fiction, the story of a person as alive as ourselves, told in the continuous present of the diary form as the story itself develops. The world of this diary is centered in Boston. What Samuel Pepys did for 17th century London or George Templeton Strong for 19th century New York, Dahl does for 19th century Boston. The city's celebrations, entertainments, mob scenes, poverty-ridden neighborhoods, rounds of social calls and lectures, as well as the public academic exhibitions across the Charles River form much of the stuff of these journals. When the selected journals began in early 1838, Boston was the country's fourth largest city with a population of some 80,000. The rapidly growing city had already, in 1835, become the nation's first rail hub. During Caroline Healy's childhood and adolescence, Boston was also a hub of another sort, a cultural focal point. The Lyceum movement flourished, bringing a wide range of lecturers before eager audiences. The movement known as Transcendentalism, a philosophy that held that one should look for truth not from authority figures or sense experience, but from one's innate sense of right and good, was in its heyday. Its major figures, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Margaret Fuller, Elizabeth Palmer Peabody, Theodore Parker, Henry David Thoreau, and others, composed a loose circle in which new and often radical ideas thrived. Reform movements of all sorts, dietary, religious, and social, abounded. In particular, as the years progressed, Boston became a center for abolitionist activity and, at times, resistance to that activity. Across the river in Cambridge, Harvard had entered upon its third century, and its divinity school produced ministers that populated the most liberal pulpits in New England. For intellectual stimulation, especially if, like Caroline Healy, one were upper class and Unitarian, Boston was a prime locale. She might well have boasted, like Henry Thoreau, that she was born in the most estimable place in all the world and in the very nick of time, too. Before we proceed in considering this text, I must introduce you further to Caroline Healy Dahl herself. She was born Caroline Wells Healy in Boston, June 22, 1822, the oldest of eight children of Mark Healy, a successful merchant, land speculator, ship owner, and president of the Merchants Bank when she was a teenager, and of Caroline Foster Healy, originally from Newburyport. Himself a self-made man with little formal ed education, Mark Healy nevertheless valued it highly and provided for his daughter an excellent private education through governesses, tutors, and private schools in Boston. He also demanded and expected great things of her. She was bred, bred and brought up, she warned her future husband, to be a literary woman. But by the beginning of 1842, Caroline's father was facing bankruptcy, a delayed fallout from the Panic of 1837. And in the fall of that year, Caroline Healy left Boston for Georgetown, D.C. There she taught at an exclusive girls' school and sent her entire earnings home to pay for her siblings' education. Homesick and heartbroken that she failed to hear from the suitor who had been attentive during the days of her father's prosperity, she was vulnerable to the attentions of a young Unitarian minister whom she met in Washington. Charles Henry Appleton Dahl. Charles Dahl was carrying on a ministry to the poor in Baltimore, and he must have seen in Caroline Healy, who had herself been actively involved in Sunday school and other benevolent activities in Boston and Washington, the perfect partner. In almost no time, they were engaged. The marriage was for several years a happy one, though marred by Charles Dahl's inability to hold a pulpit and their resultant genteel poverty. From Baltimore, they went to Boston, then to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, then to Needham, and then to Toronto, all in the space of seven years. They had two children, a son and a daughter. In Toronto, the marriage began to show signs of strain. And when Charles Dahl lost this pulpit, too, 
they moved back to the Boston area, and Charles did supply preaching before finally announcing, greatly to the surprise of his wife, his intentions to become a missionary to Calcutta. There was never any question of his taking his family with with him. They were not invited. There was also no question of divorce. Part of Charles's salary from the American Unitarian Association came to Caroline, and she publicly promoted his mission. You've no doubt heard of so-called Boston marriages. This could be called instead a Boston divorce. Respectable, it avoided outright scandal, but it achieved the purpose of keeping two incompatible people half a world away from each other. Charles remained in India for the rest of his life, more than 30 years, making only four trips home. In Charles's absence, Caroline was forced to supplement her insufficient allotment from him in various ways, from taking in boarders to writing. Finding herself suddenly, after 11 years, no longer a minister's wife in any real sense, she was also forced to work out a new identity. While Charles's leaving was emotionally wrenching, it gave Caroline a freedom that she would not otherwise have had to find a different niche for herself. That niche turned out to be the world of reform, first the abolitionism with which she had already associated herself, and then, more centrally, the women's movement. She lectured, organized conventions, wrote for and edited a a woman's journal, circulated petitions, and published books on the subject. The appearance in 1867 of her culminating work, The College, the Market, and the Court, is generally reckoned as a major event in the fledgling women's movement of of 19th century America. Shortly after the Civil War, Dahl's differences with other leaders of the women's movement surfaced, and in the mid-1860s, she began to turn her energies to an organization that she helped found, the American Social Science Association, which attempted to apply scientific methodology to all sorts of social ills. For decades, Dahl was an officer of this group, working with a largely male power structure to tackle such down-to-earth issues as prison conditions, urban lodging houses for women workers, and the purity of milk. In 1878, she left her native city, moving to Washington to be near her son. There she lived for 34 years until her death at age 90 in 1912. These are the facts of Dahl's eventful life. But her inner life, as revealed in the journals, is just as compelling. The life of the mind was central to her, And through the record of her journals, we follow as she strived to accommodate the new doctrines of transcendentalism to her religious beliefs, as she came to terms with the realities of slavery, and as her ideas on the woman question gradually developed. We witness her reactions to lectures and sermons and to her wide reading. She considered all knowledge as her province and actually published in such diverse areas as literature, politics, education, economics, history, morals, religion, science, and art. Only in the last quarter of the 19th century did she begin to experience frustration that she was unable to comprehend all the papers at professional scientific conferences, conferences that she had covered as a paid newspaper reporter for years. Through the journals, we also witness her moral dilemmas, how to treat unruly servants, whether whether to accede to her father's demands in return for financial support that she cease associating with the abolitionists, how to deal with falling in love with a man who was not her husband, what to do with a failed marriage. Most compellingly of all, perhaps, we enter into Dahl's emotional life. We follow her through the euphoria of love and the anguish of its disappointment, the depression following the delivery of a stillborn child, the humiliation of being shouted down by a New York mob, the fulfillment of finding her apparent life's work in the women's movement, and the bitterness of discovering herself eventually excluded from it by other women. The suspense of having a 20-year-old son leave home to explore Russian Alaska. The pain of rejection by her sisters, for whom she had sacrificed much. And so the journals spin out the ever-engrossing story of Caroline Dahl's mind and heart. 
Doll's personality was distinctive and un- unconventional. She was outspoken, frequently dog- dogmatic, more than occasionally unwittingly abrasive. She repeatedly struck acquaintances as egotistical, a charge that reached her ears numerous times and caused her great anguish. She regularly acted out her sense of duty, even when it was clear that doing so was not in her personal interest. She was an exceedingly strong person. Despite the self-pity that she frequently gave way to in her journal, she was anything but passive. Her journal is a record of storms braved, obstacles overcome, challenges to her faith wrestled with, and severe blows to her ego parried. The reader of these journals will come away with a real sense of the person, Caroline Dahl. But what, we might ask, besides its length, makes this diary extraordinary? Dahl's journal is an outstanding example of its genre for many reasons. One major reason is its fortuitously proportionate mixture of the public and the private. Here we find extended portraits and notable vignettes of many of the extraordinary people of the times. A brief and incomplete list would include Margaret Fuller, Elizabeth Peabody, Emerson, Thoreau, Theodore Parker, Bronson and Louisa May Alcott, Dorothea Dix, Harriet Hosmer, William Lloyd Garrison, Wendell Phillips, Frederick Douglass, Daniel Webster, William H. Herndon, Lucretia Mott, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucy Stone, Ann Whitney, Mrs. Grover Cleveland, George Frisbee Hoare, the Alexander Graham Bells, and eminent Canadians such as Paul Kane, the father of Canadian painting, novelist Susanna Moody, and ethnologist and president of the University of Toronto, Daniel Wilson, who invented the term prehistory. But we also become acquainted with the lives of people whose names have not made it into the history texts, of wives and mothers and fugitives and servants, children, starving ministers, single women looking for outlets for their ambitions, and working people of all sorts. Dahl witnesses and reports on the lectures, conversations, and sermons that characterize the circles of Boston's intelligentsia, on the beginnings of an intellectual elite, uh, intellectual and artistic elite in Toronto of the 1850s, on anti-slavery meetings, reform conventions of all kinds, including some that turn rowdy. She reports on the mood and activities of Civil War Boston, on the split in the abolitionist ranks after the war, on Unitarian conventions and politics, and on the formation of the radical wing of Unitarians into the Free Religious Association on the social scene in late century Washington, peopled by senators and Supreme Court justices and their wives, on the scientific community in Washington centered around the Smithsonian. And at the same time, she reports on the routines and annoyances of daily life, on plumbing problems, on sewing. It's staggering to contemplate the amount of doll's life, especially the first half of her life that was spent in sewing, on illnesses and their treatment, with plasters and blisters and blue pills and leeches on the one hand and high-tech electric shock treatments for a strange malady in her hands on the other. In the last decade of her life, when she suffered severely from arthritis, she noted with great hope the advent of a new miracle drug, aspirin. On her frustrations with servants, and she must have run through hundreds in her lifetime. One morning, she arose to face almost all these frustrations at once, Not only were she and both children sick, requiring, quote, two mustard plasters on the children last night, one on myself this morning before I could speak a loud word. Then she found the water and drain pipes frozen when I got up. And to crown the occasion, her servant informed me this morning that she would rather I would get another girl, for she would like to live with a pleasanter-looking lady. At which, Dahl further commented, I did not wonder. But the chief topic of the diary is yet less public than even the trivial frustrations of everyday life. It is Caroline Dahl herself, her mind and heart. But it's not just the what, the subject, but the how, the style, that sets this diary apart. Though we might be interested in accounts, her accounts of public persons and events, no matter how poorly she expressed them, that would hardly be the case when she writes of purely personal matters. Dahl is a truly expert and fluent writer. She seems to have the resources of language at her command to the extent that this journal is stylistically polished, pithy and acute, sprinkled with searing judgments of friend and foe, 
and written practically without revision. Furthermore, these qualities characterize even the very earliest journals. In introducing you to this journal, I would certainly do you a great disservice if if I did not share with you some sample passages that will, I hope, illustrate my somewhat extravagant-sounding claims for this text. So I'm going to read and comment on four selections, which will give you the flavor and allow you to feel the power of the journals. Among the more remarkable passages in the journals depicting public events are those that describe the often rousing and sometimes turbulent anti-slavery meetings at which Dahl was present. The meeting that I'm about to read about is one of the first such that she ever attended and is marked by her first hearing of Frederick Douglass. The date is May 30th, 1849. I found it raining heavily, and under the shelter of Aunt Anne's umbrella, I went down to the meeting of the Anti-Slavery Society, where I stayed all the morning through the heavy storm. I was glad I went, for I heard fine speaking from Wendell Phillips, Foster and his wife, Frederick Douglass, and Ramond. In this speaking, there was nothing fanatical, nothing severe. It was creditable to the Christianity of the speakers. Uh, Let me interrupt Dahl in order to tell you of, of Dahl's father's strong opposition to the abolitionists. Here, I think it's obvious that she is reassuring herself of the rationality and Christianity of the participants. And she continues, Douglas, Frederick Douglass, in eloquence, argument, and force of will, a much neglected but very important part of public speaking, far surpassed them all. The meeting took up again the next day, Thursday, May 31st, 1849. I sewed and taught Willie till it was time to attend the anti-slavery meeting. It was intensely exciting, and chiefly because after Stephen Foster had made one of his most disagreeable and repulsive speeches, Douglas rose and vindicated his own Christianity and that of true reform in one of the finest that ever fell from the lips of man. God bless Frederick Douglass. God bless him and his cause. So prayed I while he spoke, so pray I now. During the violent address of Foster, too weak in soul and body to rise myself, I was inwardly praying that God would raise up an apostle to speak against such folly. He was followed by Charles Burley in a noble speech, but one of those quite likely to be misinterpreted. I prayed again with a broken spirit, for I felt that this was not what was needed. But after Douglas had risen, I sang, and my song was an anthem of praise. I could not restrain my enthusiasm. He seemed to me while he spoke greater than any man to whom I had ever listened. And the moment the meeting had closed, I went upon the stage and thanked him in person. What would Father have said had he seen me then? No matter. God knows I was in the way of my duty, and with an undivided heart, I asked no questions then. May I never in the future. Well, in this passage, the interweaving of the public and the personal is apparent. Dahl is reporting on and preserving a public event at a certain time and place, but she is at the same time and more centrally depicting a watershed moment in her own consciousness, a moment when she's not only completely overwhelmed by way of Douglas's eloquence with the righteousness of the cause and the greatness of the man, Frederick Douglass, but when she consciously rejects her father's dominion and opts for duty instead. It's a defining and characteristic moment. Dahl's account, 11 years later, of a woman's rights convention in Boston that she helped to organize gives an insider's view of the sorts of tensions that developed among the reformers themselves, all, and and Dahl not the least, with fragile egos as well as high ideals. Dahl's account of this convention records a breach between her and Thomas Wentworth Higginson, himself a major feminist. It reads, in part... Now that the meetings are over, and I thank God on my knees for a splendid success, I can afford to forget the irritations which were heaped into today. Only one must be recorded. It was so remarkable in kind and quality. A note from W.T. Clark informing me that he was too ill to speak was put into my hands. Mrs. Cheney saw the embarrassment in which I was placed and went in, turn, uh, went in search of General Tubman, this is Harriet Tubman, to relieve me. 
As I turned to thank her, I saw Higginson and went immediately to her gym to speak. His look struck me in a moment, inflamed and irate. He looked like the red and angry visage which hung over Jane Eyre's bed the night before her wedding. I am glad to see you, I said. As you did not come to the meet committee meeting yesterday, I supposed you were not coming. Now for your speech. No, said he, in the most excited and angry manner. No, I will never speak upon a platform where less than half the speakers are women. It is useless. Such meetings as you are holding here today, such a meeting, does more harm than good. Women must speak for themselves. Where shall we get the women, I asked. Plenty of them, plenty in this audience, he continued. We should be glad to see them, I replied. But Mr. Higginson, while we women argue for men, we expect such men as you to argue for our women. We cannot expect women to tread these boards till men like you show that they consider it respectable. It's no use to speak of it, replied he determinately. My mind is made up on that subject. I shan't speak under such circumstances. And Mrs. Dahl, speaking with an emphasis and anger which drew the attention of the audience, Mrs. Dahl, you made two misstatements in your address. It is ruinous. You must be careful. Indeed, said I, after a moment's pause, thunderstruck by a manner to which no words can do justice. Indeed, I am not in the habit. You are in the habit, the constant habit, he reiterated in a tone which quieted me at once, for I saw I was speaking to an insane man. You must change it. What particular mistake have I made today, I inquired. You said General Tubman had been back into slavery 13 times. She has been but eight. And that story of Miss Mitchell, which I told you, was greatly altered. She never said that no man ever thought to do what she had done, etc., etc. I am quite sure that Higginson's intention in this matter was to break up my composure and prevent matters going on triumphantly. The malicious desire shone out of his eye, but of course it's not a thing to be proved. Hinton had been speaking in a dull way about Kansas law while this was going on, and as soon as he closed, I led our dark friend Moses, Harriet Tubman, forward, and as soon as the storm of applause which succeeded had broken, I said, my friends, I am told that in the address which I have just made, I made two mistakes. Now you know that I believe in faithful work. See also that I believe in faithful confession. I heard that Harriet Tubman had been back into slavery 13 times. Before I rose to speak this afternoon, my friend Mrs. Cheney confirmed the impression, but it seems she has been back only eight times. I'm also told that I made a mistake in the anecdote I related of Miss Mitchell. As I do not know what it was, I cannot retract it. But when you hear the story again, make allowance for me. We had once in this neighborhood a professor of chemistry, quite famous for breaking retorts and spilling his mixtures. When his last drop of acid had been spilled, he would turn around to his class and say, gentlemen, the experiment fails, but the fact remains the same. So I to you, if the illustration fails, the argument remains the same. This brought down the house, and also Mr. Higginson, for he left the stand soon after. Dahl, it will be noted, is at a huge advantage in telling this story. It is her diary, and she has the last word. Her diary, in fact, in which her perspective is compellingly presented, will serve as her greatest revenge for many an attack or slight. One of the most notable journal passages about the Civil War appears to be a conscious attempt by Dahl to preserve a moment of history. The passage describes the reaction in Boston and in Medford, where Dahl was living at the time, to the Second Battle of Bull Run. Her description is written shortly after initial reports reaching Boston make clear that a devastating Union defeat with a terrific toll of casualties is in the making. They would turn out to be in all some 15,000 Union casualties. Dahl gets word of the battle, as you will see, <clears throat> almost simultaneously with the news that her husband, Charles, has, after many misadventures, arrived in Boston on the ship the Panther for his first visit home since his departure for India nearly seven years earlier. This is a Sunday, and Dahl goes early into Boston from Medford, August 31st, 1862. The first thing I heard when I reached town was 
that the panther was in the bay. I heard Mr. Clark preach, yet hardly heard him, for I longed for the service to be over, that I might hurry home and help prepare lint and bandages. No one who was in Boston today will ever forget it. No one but will be proud to own it as a birthplace. The car which I took from Dover Street to court was crowded to a crush with women and bundles. Most of them were weeping. Give way, said rough men to each other. Those bundles are sacred. When we got to the Tremont house, a dense crowd had pressed between it and the hall. All were eagerly gaping for rumors. About the Tremont Temple, a semicircular rope was stretched, enclosing several hundreds of cubic feet. At three tables placed in the center and at each end, men took down subscriptions for the freight fund. Within, on the sidewalk, immense boxes were being packed. In the building, 1,800 women sewed all day. Through each of the three passages stretched lines of men standing six feet apart. When we drew near, women with bundles were crowding all the avenues and the streets as far as one could see. Delicate women in Sunday attire, followed by one, two, or three servants carrying bundles as large as themselves, pressed up among the ruder sort. The bundles were passed over the barrier, tossed from hand to hand along the lines till they reached the inner workroom. I got out and going up to the clerk got all the information I needed for Medford. The impression seemed to be that Pope, reinforced, was fighting again. In the car that went to Medford, everybody was bitterly depressed. The women thought that if we conquered in the end, the life of the camp would ruin our young men, that they would come home worse, licentious, cruel. I could not stand this, and the end was that I appealed aloud to the women in a plea lasting partly in a conversational way nearly the whole time we were coming out as to the moral end of the war. How moved the whole population were we can judge from the fact that one could hear a pin drop in that rattling car and there was not a smile at me on man's or woman's face. Across the square, as we came into Medford, a perfect crowd were hurrying with bundles. The select men went round in Medford and stopped all the services, ordering the citizens and such relief as they could spare to the town hall. Willie, this is her son, came out at dusk, that is, out from Boston to Medford, to tell me that his father would not get to Medford till tomorrow. I was surprised to find that in the general distress I had forgotten my private pain, not having thought of the panther after thinking of nothing else for months since I heard she was in the bay. In this passage, the dominant public scene is framed by references to the private anticipated reunion of Dahl with her husband. The public event is of such moment that it seems to crowd out what would otherwise have been such a significant private point in time. And indeed, that's the spin that Dahl deliberately gives to the episode at the end. These events were so great, she says, that I forgot my private concerns. What the passage also may be seen to reveal, however, is an unconscious subtext. For Dahl, the return of her husband <clears throat> was not the focus of unmitigated, pleasurable anticipation that we may imagine it would have been for many wives. Though she has suppressed the panther in the bay, at least some wives would not have allowed even a Union defeat at Bull Run to push it out of their minds. Though she says she's thought of little else for weeks, many, if not most, of her thoughts about Charles's return centered on the emotional upheaval that was likely to attend it. From the uneasy pondering of this problematic reunion, um, acting, acting to relieve the distress of Union soldiers must have been a welcome respite. It's telling but not surprising, then, that Dahl's thoughts and feelings and caregiving are centered on these anonymous soldiers rather than on the homecoming of her own husband. For the last reading, I've chosen a selection that recounts a purely private event, almost as private as it's possible to imagine, the event of childbirth. It's a passage that, I believe, would elicit the sympathies of Dahl's worst enemy. Friday, April 21st, 1848. It is five weeks tomorrow since my confinement, and I take up my pen with a heavy heart and retrace my painful steps. 
On Saturday morning, March 18, 1848, I was seized with pains, slight at first, but rapidly becoming more severe at the breakfast table. I washed up my silver, however, and made some blancmange and prepared my basket while Mr. Dahl went for Mrs. Parker and to ask Dr. Noyes to remain at home through the day. I was just on the point of preparing my bed when I felt a sudden relief from the breaking of the water. I undressed and threw myself hastily on the bed, from which I was not destined to rise again until all was over. Meanwhile, my girl ran for the doctor and Mrs. Revere, my nearest neighbor. They stayed with me until my husband returned, which was at half past 9 a.m. At 1 p.m., we had dinner, and as my husband left the room, he stopped and held me through my first severe pain. Our Irish cook came up to stay with me while they ate. Two pains, rending, splitting, tearing me asunder with inconceivable rapidity, followed quick upon the first, and while my girl went to the head of the stairs to call Mrs. Parker, I fell back exhausted by agony, and my child was born. My child. Why should I call it so? But after one has borne a second life about with her for eight months, it is impossible not to love it, though it should prove an abortion. The babe was a boy and had a hair lip. Its hands and feet were bent in and enlarged at the wrists and ankles. It had no thumb on the right hand, but instead five fingers, the fifth growing out of the first. The smaller intestines were formed on the outside, and the scrotum was deficient. It had been dead at least a fortnight, the cuticle slipping at the touch. On Friday, March 3rd, I was attacked with egg, fit, and nausea, and it was probably at that time that the child died. Its feebleness will be readily understood when I say I felt as much motion on the 17th of March as I had ever done. My mother <clears throat> and attendants referred all my trials to previous mental impressions, but I could not yield to this. I still believed in the benevolence of God. I did not gain very fast, for Charles, in his love of truth, after having buried his little one with his own trembling hands, was altogether too communicative to those who inquired, and the consequence was that the town rung with the peculiarities of the case, and constant aggravations of them coming from the neighbors to my bedside worried me. My husband would not understand my earnest entreaties that I might be spared this bitter trial, and his want of sympathy finished my misery. I was already bent beneath the hand of God quite low enough, but the hours have passed, and may the Father of mercies grant never to return. As I did not gain, as was desired, on Wednesday, April 12th, I left my husband and child and my home to stay at Lynn, that is her parents' home, a few days. We were just at breakfast when Father returned from the West. I caught his first embrace in the entry and the question, where is your baby? brought the ready tears to my eyes. He held me with a father's pressure to his bosom as I sobbed forth my reply. I laid my head upon his shoulder and wept there for our mutual suffering brought back the hour of Charlie's death. It was a five-year-old brother. Long as I may live, it will be impossible for me ever to forget his tender fatherly pressure. I went to see Dr. Warren. This was the family physician of her childhood. At half past 12 o'clock, After a long interview, he told me to dismiss the subject of my confinement entirely from my mind, that I was in no wise responsible for its results, that he did not believe in the effect of mental impressions on the child, that children deformed like mine were the common result of a great weakness, either in the mother or the child. The passage describing the childbirth itself is, it seems to me, a magnificent piece of prose. After announcing the onset of her labor pains, Dahl builds suspense, making us wait for the conclusion as she washes the dishes and makes blancmange and gets things in readiness. Her severe pains are juxtaposed to the mundane, to the necessity of everyone else's eating dinner, and thus made more stark. And the restrained description of the stillborn child, detailing flatly and in neutral language, one by one, its unspeakable deformities, produces a chilling effect. Who are the villains here? Her husband, who has violated her wishes and spread abroad the details of the child's deformities. 
He has loved the truth more than he has loved her. And her mother and her attendants, that female world that should function as her support, they have instead att- attempted to somehow place responsibility for the tragedy on the anguished mother herself, who is vindicated. She herself is vindicated, for she refuses to accept the blame. And her father, who holds her once again as if she were a child, and the paternal doctor, who absolves her from fault, and God, whom she simply refuses to blame. This is one of the passages that emotionally bind us as readers to Dahl and demonstrate the power of the journals. Once we have not only witnessed her agony, but by the power of language and imagination participated in it, it is almost impossible to withhold sympathy from the diarist. Though readers will come to Dahl's journals for many reasons, I believe that the ultimate interest and appeal of these writings will derive from their subjectivity. Dahl gives us accounts of actual happenings, and these accounts include facts and details. But the true subject of the journals is not so much these events and facts as her response to them. Events are filtered through her consciousness, judged by her light, spun according to her agenda. It is, above everything, the sense of Dahl herself that the journals cumulatively convey. Here is the fascinating human story of a woman both ordinary in her needs and flaws and frustrations and failures and extraordinary in her intelligence and her vision of new paradigms for women's lives and her commitment to her ideals. The journals are ultimately a great text because Caroline Healy Dahl herself is a great subject, and because she is remarkably articulate in presenting her world and her vision and her story. Dahl once struggled in her journals to understand why God, who, in her words, having gifted me so strangely, had not yet made clear to her her vocation. She could not quite see that her greatest legacy was not to be what she would have called her work. But we are in a position to see that the perfect and inevitable expression of her peculiar talents, of this strange giftedness, was to be her life story itself, this romance-like story, preserved in the form of the journals that both resulted from the life and helped to shape it. Thank you. Michelle has the microphone. I do. We have time for a few questions. So if you want the microphone, just raise your hand. All right. Hi, I enjoyed that very much. Thank you. I would like to find out if you could talk a little bit, please, about the rift between Elizabeth Palmer Peabody and uh, Mrs. And Dahl, Dahl and, and what, why Peabody went around spreading prejudice uh, ah. on her. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> Um, You had here two women, both with very strong personalities and very strong egos, I think. And um, um, I think what happened eventually was probably inevitable. But um, Dahl saw her, when she first met her, Dahl was 18, was Caroline Healy then. Um, Peabody was 36, twice her age, and she was an important mentor uh, to Dahl. Um, And for Many years, they got along well. Um, but Peabody was not, like Dahl herself, was not um, shy in criticizing people. And uh, many of her criticisms, Dahl bore pretty well, you know, and, and, and went on. But at a certain point, and this letter is lost, so I don't know what the actual uh, precipitating thing was, but she wrote a letter that after which they never spoke to each other again. This was, this was Peabody to Dahl. Um, Dahl continued to, I think, be pretty charitable <laughs> toward Peabody in her, her statements about her, later statements about her. She gave her a great deal of credit. She thought she was a brilliant woman. Um, 
But at, for the last several decades of their lives, they didn't speak to each other, and I don't know what the exact thing was, but it was the culmination of a number of, of similar events. In the, uh, the part about the abolitionists, mm-hmm. um, uh, the, the, the selection suggests um, some sort of issue about Foster and how awful yeah. he was and stuff. Does the book... Uh, go into more detail that she doesn't in the diary about what these different issues are? Um, the book is annotated. Um, and, and some matters like that, you will, there will be a note saying, you know, this was probably Stephen Foster ranting uh, uh, in his, uh, as he often did, against the clergy. Um, so, yes, there are annotations that often fill out a little bit. Um, the events or, or the things that she refers to. I have another question. Um, in what you said at the beginning, at 20 years old, she was thinking about this diary as one for the ages. I mean, do you see that level of self-consciousness or score settling or, um, you know, making right. yourself Right. That, that's a good, good question, yeah. And if I'd had more time, I would have talked about it. Um, how can we rely on this journal? Can we rely on it if we think, you know, that she knew that she was going to preserve it? Um, which gets around to the question, too, of why did she write it? Why was she writing it? And I think the main reason she wrote it was she needed, for herself, she needed to get it out. Um, when she's in her uh, 70s, she goes back through the journal, and if, in a few cases, she marks out or even cuts out some things, which would suggest that it, while she's in the process of writing it, she's not censoring herself. Um, she's being forthcoming and, and revealing. And, in fact, she often reveals herself in very humiliating situations in the journals. Um, so it's a, it's a complicated answer, but um, we've obvious got, obviously got to take into account that this is from her perspective, that she does have an agenda and so forth, but as far as her deliberately skewing things or deliberately falsifying things, I don't believe she does it. Not very many. Not very many. They were almost all to do with her relationship with men who were not her husband. Um. <laughs> You, you indicated in the introduction that she uh, had some disputes with other feminists. I mean, yes. beyond what you've just said about uh, uh, Peabody, would you like to expatiate on that? Yes. Um, uh, Stanton and Anthony, for example, um, she had a difference of opinion with uh, particularly Stanton on bringing up the whole business of marriage, of making ma- putting marriage on the table. Um, she felt, Dahl felt, that this was going to alienate more people than it was going to gain. She wanted to make women's rights something that people on Beacon Hill and in Cambridge could support. Um, uh, Stanton was too radical for her. Um, she also didn't approve of Stanton and Anthony's um, collaboration, I guess you would say, with, with um, someone who was considered to be a racist uh, after the war. Um, then there was a whole group of, of Boston feminists, Lucy Stone, Edna Cheney, and so forth, that you would think then that she would have been aligned with, but, but this crew too she didn't get along with, and there it was mainly personality difficulties. And when the New England Women's Club was established, Dahl heard about it, you know, and was very surprised that she wasn't in the middle of it. And then she discovered that she had been blackballed from it. So, um, so she just sort of dropped out of the women's movement, uh, having been shut out by the Boston women and having, you know, these differences with the New York women. Yes. yes. Hi. I was wondering, um, do you know of any other diaries of this kind of scope of magnitude from the 19th century, or is this one really unique? Um, published or not published? I, yeah, I can, uh, I can say more about the 19th century than the 20th. I, but uh, as far as I know, there's nothing that comes close to it. Um, now, John Quincy Adams' diary, um, I believe, covers 
like 69 years, something like that. This is about 75, and, and atoms may be longer. Atoms may be longer than this. Um, but as far as years covered, I haven't been able to discover one that's gone longer anytime, anywhere. Uh, I was interested in what you were saying about her relationship to the New England Women's Club and wonder uh, what her interaction with Julia Ward Howe might have been. Uh, same thing. Um, yeah, Howe was one of these women whom she felt, Dahl felt, that she had, that Dahl had broken the ice, had paved the way for Howe and Caroline Severance and so forth. And um, then these people, from her point of view, turn on her. She asks people, th this is a blow she never recovers from. And she's always asking people, or occasionally she asks people, you know, why? And um, what, she gets various answers. One was, um, because, they say, because you, 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 can, you rule wherever you go or something like that. You, you have to have your way, basically. And another answer was, because you are too smart for them. So that was obviously a friend telling her that. <laughs> I think um, if you have anyone else has any questions, uh, Mrs. Deese will be at the table back here with the books. I want to thank her again for speaking here today. This was just wonderful. And thank you all for coming and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.